The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So let's get uh, ready. Um, if good, you should uh, receive some handouts. So the TAs are walking around. So you should uh, slowly get those. Um, this is the second lecture on uh, number theory, and we're going to cover a lot of stuff. And actually, we're going to start with uh, um, encryption, which is an application of uh, number theory. And we will take that as a theme throughout the whole lecture. And so in this way, you can see how useful number theory is. Um, now, um, encryption, uh, yeah, what is it? So let's first talk about that a little bit. Maybe some of you have heard about it, but cryptology in general is the art of hiding uh, information. And encryption is a very useful tool. I will only give a very high level overview. I mean, if you really want to know more about this, you should do a class in, in, in encrypto or, 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 or practical security. Um, so what's encryption? Um, the idea is usually that beforehand um, we're going to share a whole bunch of keys. So keys are exchanged uh, between a receiver and a sender. And the whole idea is that if I want to transmit like a message to one of you, uh, well, there could be someone in the middle who wants to intercept my, my message and wants to find out what I'm saying. So I do not like this. And in order to avoid it, I will use encryption, which is some kind of algorithm that actually uh, transforms um, my message M, my plain message, by using some kind of algorithm E, some encryption algorithm. Uh, it can be a function as well. Um, that uses the keys in order to transform this into an encryption, which we call M prime here. So the plain text uh, has in the clear all the information that I want to convey to one of you, for example, and M prime is somehow uh, a complete, uh, uh, well, a mixture of bits uh, out of which I'm not able to distill any information about the plain text. So encryption is a very special kind of thing. And we're not going to talk about the precise definitions here, but we just take the ID into uh, this lecture. Now decryption is uh, transforming the ciphertext back into the plain text. So we will start with the encryption, uh, M prime, and we have some kind of decryption algorithm and again, we can make use of the keys that we exchanged. And we transform it back into the plain message. So only if I know the keys, I can actually transform back the encrypted version into the plain version. So, well, in encryption schemes, we like both these algorithms to be really, uh, really efficient. And um, the security of such a scheme, well, the first uh, kind of uh, intuition that we can get is that, well, if I'm a man in the middle somewhere intercepting like an encrypted message, M prime, I should not be able to get any information about M if I have no knowledge about those keys. So this is uh, uh, the example that we're going to take throughout this whole uh, lecture. So let's start with uh, a first um, uh, possible scheme. Um, Turing, who uh, lived like uh, uh, around uh, uh, 1900, um, I think 36, he was 24 years old, and he lived uh, uh, till about, actually, I think he was about uh, 54 when he died. Um, in any case, Turing was the one who first originally proposed um, to use number theory in cryptography. And uh, before he joined the British Army, before the Second World War, he actually, um, uh, proposed a scheme, but it got never published. So here in this class, we are going to uh, try to think about what he could have thought about. So we will have a first scheme 
uh, which we will call Turing's code, version number one. And uh, the whole idea is that we are going to translate a message, first of all, into a prime number, uh, because we want to use numbers. You're here in number theory class, so we want to use some tricks with numbers in order to encrypt it. So let's do this. Um, so for example, let's take the word uh, victory. Uh, we can map this into uh, an integer. For example, we could say, well, m is um, 22, where I map v to, because I know that v is the 22nd letter in the alphabet, I just start with 22. i is the ninth letter in the, alpha, in, in, in the alphabet, so I append 0, 9. Uh, C is the third letter in the alphabet. I append a three, zero, three. I continue like this. And in the end, over here, I have mapped Y to uh, the 25th letter. Because it's the 25th letter of the alphabet, I write 25. It turns out I can just add a couple of uh, digits more if I specially compute those. Uh, in this case, I could add 13. And then it changes into a prime number. Um, now, we're not going to talk about why this is and how this can be done and so on, but uh, it turns out that the prime numbers are densely uh, distributed over the integers, and it is really possible to, just with a few extra digits, uh, by selecting them in a smart way, to actually create a prime number and also verify that it is a prime number very efficiently. So it's very easy to compute, uh, to translate such a word into a prime number. So this is how it all starts. And just like in an encryption scheme, um, beforehand, we are going to um, exchange a, a key. So we exchange a secret uh, prime in this example, which we call K. And the encryption is very simple. We are just going to multiply m with k. Now you may wonder why is this such a fantastic ID, but let's, uh, let's bear with me. So m is this first prime number, and we multiply it by a second prime number, and that's going to be our encryption. Now, how do we decrypt? That seems to be pretty straightforward, right? How do we do it? Uh, we start off with m prime. Um, I know we have exchanged the secret prime k. So if I receive uh, from you this message, this encrypted message, well, I know the key k. So I just divide it by k, well, which is mk divided by k, and I get m. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, it turns out, actually, and I'll write it up here because we need it later, that um, it's not so trivial to actually just given m prime to figure out what m is, or k. m prime is the product of two very large prime numbers, and uh, that turns out to be a really hard problem up to now. Nobody has really been able to get a really efficient algorithm to solve that. So we may think this is secure. So let me write it down. Um, it's hard to factor a uh, product of two large primes. We will actually need this also when we come to the final encryption scheme, RSA, that we will discuss, which is widely used. Um, so, But something is wrong here, though. This seems to be too simple, right? So what can we do if we have, like, say, suppose I intercept two encrypted messages? What, what can I do? Uh, so suppose I have uh, a first message, uh, m prime 1, which is the product of a first plain message times the key k. And I have a second uh, message that is encrypted by using the same key, which is m2 times k. Does anybody have an idea what I could do here? Yeah, yeah you could uh, find the GCD 
of uh, m1 prime and m2 prime. Um, I've intercepted those two. Now m1 is a prime number, k is a prime number, m2 is a prime number, k is a prime number here also, right? So they're all uh, relatively prime towards one another. The GCD of these two, well, the greatest common divisor is k. So just by calculating the GCD of the two encrypted uh, messages, I will be able to figure out what uh, k is, the key. So that's, uh, well, if I know the key, then uh, I can do uh, the decryption of any uh, ciphertext, any encryption of a message that, that I can intercept. So this is not secure. So how can we uh, change this? Can we uh, create a, a different kind of uh, um, encryption scheme? Let's do something much more uh, difficult, and, uh, and then we will get into modular arithmetic and things like that. So let's do this. Um, so Turing's code version number two, we try to uh, do something much more compli complicated than just multiplying by prime. So let's do the following. So beforehand, uh, we are going to exchange a, uh, uh, not only a secret prime k, but we will also exchange uh, a public prime. So we exchange, uh, by public we mean that anybody uh, can see this uh, prime, it's, it's, it's common knowledge, a public prime p, and also uh, a secret prime Okay, well, let's see whether this uh, would work. Um, we have an encryption. Well, we're going to start out exactly the same way. Um, uh, oh, uh, first of all, I should tell you how a message is represented. A message is going to be represented as a number, um, m, in the range from 0, 1, all the way to p minus 1. And we will compute the encryption as follows. Uh, m uh, is going to be the remainder of m times k after dividing out as many multiples of p as possible. So notice we do kind of the same thing. We just multiply by k, but now we just uh, um, take the remainder after taking out as many multiples of p. Um, well, let's see whether we can do the decryption. It seems to be uh, like a next level of complexity, so maybe that will help us here, right? So how would we do decryption? Well, somehow we would like to divide by k, but we cannot really do that, right? Um, this does not make any sense. So the decryption, we have no idea at this point how to do this. And, um, now we can get into modular arithmetic because it turns out that we can sort of divide by k. There exists a what we call multiplicative inverse of k modulo p, and I will explain all those terminology to you. And um, then we will be able to take m prime and transform it back to m. So we will be able to get a lot of this machinery um, uh, going. So let's... Uh, find out how this works. Uh, so first of all, uh, last time we saw that um, uh, we defined A and B to be relatively prime. So let me repeat that. So A and B are relatively prime. Um, if and only if, that's how we defined it, if the GCD of A and B is equal to one. And uh, in last lecture and in the recitation, you got a different proof, I think. Um, we proved that actually uh, the GCD of A and B is equal to the smallest positive linear combination of A and B. So that means that one in particular is a linear combination of A and B. So there exists integers S and T such that S times A plus T times B equals one. It turns out that we can also go the other way around because if I can write one as a linear combination of A and B, 
Well, I cannot get much lower than that, right? So that's really the smallest possible that I can achieve. So the GCD must be equal to 1. So this is a property that we will be using. Um, and uh, from this property, we can already figure out uh, an interesting property. So suppose we have a linear combination that looks like this. And you can imagine that uh, sort of that S times A is equal to 1 plus or minus some linear uh, multiple of B. So it's sort of S times A is sort of equal to 1, you can say, up to a multiple of B. So uh, you can see A sort of as an inverse of S because S times A is equal to 1, sort of. So this is what we're going to use, this kind of uh, feeling. And um, in order to do that, we are going to define uh, congruency. Um, so that's the first definition for this lecture. Uh, we say X is a congruent uh, to Y modulo N uh, if uh, which we denote as follows, x with uh, three bars, y in between brackets, mod n. And uh, we say that this is the case uh, if um, n divides the difference between x and y. So let's, just, uh, let's have a look at some examples. Um, So let's uh, take 31, and I'd like to show to you that this is congruent to 16 modulo, between brackets, uh, 5. Why is this? Well, I take the difference between 31 and 16, which is 15, and I know that 15 is 3 times 5, so 5 divides this difference, and then by the definition, we can write it like this, and we say, that's the definition. 31 is congruent to 16 modulo 5. Another example is, um, oh no, we will stick with this example. It's pretty clear. Um, so once we have defined this, uh, we can continue and uh, talk about this inverse that I was talking about. So we like to sort of explain in this encryption scheme uh, how we can divide by k. Actually, we would like to multiply by an inverse of k. And we're going to use this, this framework. So we'll have a new definition that talks about the multiplicative inverse. So it's a new concept. And we'll give a couple of examples. So the multiplicative inverse um, of x modulo n is a, a number which we denote by x and then minus 1 on top of here. Uh, it's a number in the interval 0, 1, all the way up to n minus 1, uh, such that x times x inverse, so x times its multiplicative inverse is congruent to 1 modulo n. So this is the definition for a multiplicative inverse. So let's have an, uh, some examples. Um, so let's do this over here. Uh, for example, we have that uh, 2 times 3, which equals 6, right, is equal to 1 modulo 5. Why is this? Well, uh, 6 minus 1 is divisible by 5, so I know that this is congruent to 1 modulo 5. So what does this mean? Uh, well, we can say that 2 is actually equal to the multiplicative inverse of 3 modulo 5. Uh, we can also say that, uh, right, that 3 is the multiplicative inverse of 2 modulo 5. Let's have another example, uh, just to make it a little bit more clear. 
we know that 5 times 5 equals 25. And this is congruent to 1 modulo uh, 6, because uh, 25 is 1 plus 4 times 6. So now we see something funny happening, because 5 is actually equal to its own multiplicative inverse, modulo 6. So, so are there any questions about these concepts? Because these are really basic for the whole lecture, and this is what you really need to understand if you do all the problem sets as well. Um, are there any questions? So now we can actually uh, start uh, talking about this uh, uh, second version of the Turing code that we uh, uh, invented. Um, Let's have a look at this remainder. So let's write it out again. The remainder of uh, m times k after dividing out as many multiples of p, well, we know that this is congruent to m times k modulo p. So why is this? Uh, well, we just uh, apply the definition over here. We take the difference between those two. So here we have the remainder of m times k after dividing out as many multiples of p. Um, and if we subtract that from m times k, well, then we have something that is a multiple of p because that's what we divided out. So the difference is a multiple of p. Um, so that means that p divides the difference. And that's the definition of saying that this remainder is congruent to mk modulo p. So this is kind of interesting because now um, we can rewrite over there, uh, well, not really rewrite, but we can uh, use this to analyze the encryption over here. So m prime is equal to this uh, remainder. And we get a beautiful equation. We see that the encryption is congruent to the plain message times the key modulo p. So how do I do decryption? I can use the multiplicative inverse of k, right? So then. I can uh, divide k out, so, so let's write this out as well. So suppose I have a multiplicative inverse, k to the power minus 1, uh, that is congruent to 1 modulo p. Why do I uh, do this? Why, why am I writing this out? Because uh, we will see that it is not always possible to have a multiplicative inverse. That's going to be really a big problem. And that's uh, where uh, all these other uh, functions come in, the Euler-Toshant function and Euler's theorem and so on. So it's not really uh, always the case. We'll give an example in a moment. But suppose that we have a multiplicative inverse, modulo p. Well, then I'm able to easily compute. Well, I take m prime. I multiply it with k inverse. Well, this is, I'm substituting for m prime m times k times k inverse. I still have this left. Now I can say that those, that this is equal to uh, 1 modulo p. So this is equal or is congruent to m modulo p. So now we see how we can do decryption. We simply use the multiplicative inverse of k. And as in the first uh, Turing code, we are able to somehow uh, divide out. So where did I have it? To divide out k. I, I did it very differently. I have a very different mathematical structure. But uh, the idea is essentially the same. I have a multiplicative inverse of k. And if I multiply this with the encryption, I will get the plain message, modulo p. So am I finished now is the question. Well, uh, I know that m is in the range uh, of 0, 1, all the way up to p minus 1. So um, this means that I can also rewrite m as, and I use a similar trick as what I did over here, I can rewrite m as the remainder of m prime times k inverse after dividing out as many copies of p as possible. So what we did here is to first prove that the difference between those two 
is a multiple of P. That's essentially what congruent modulo P means. That's the definition. So now that I know that the difference is a multiple of P, um, and if I know that M is actually in this range up to P minus 1, I can use what we learned uh, last lecture and what the book was talking about, that the definition of the remainder of M prime times K inverse, this thing, after defining out as many copies of P, is exactly this plain message M. Okay, so now we have the decryption. So this is decryption. And uh, that sounds great. So now, uh, of course, we are wondering, uh, well, if we uh, can do this, can we also uh, attack this scheme, right? Can we do something bad with it? Um, well, it can be used to break this code, but in a slightly more uh, complicated way. Um, so let's see where I put that. Right, so what we are going to use now, uh, so when we talk about security and so on, uh, you can think of all kinds of ways to break uh, an encryption scheme. So we started out with, in the first version, well, what if I just know the encryption and then, um, well, I cannot know anything about the plain text simply because I know that it's very hard to factor, to factor a product of two large primes. Then I said, but suppose I can know a little bit more as an adversary. Suppose I have a plain message together with a... Uh, um, encrypted message, well, then I could do this GCD trick and figure out uh, and break the scheme. And now we're going to do something similar, and we say, well, suppose um, uh, that I do not know two encryptions, but I know uh, a plain message and a an corresponding encrypted message. So if I know such a pair, which is, I mean, in practice, uh, such, such type of information will be leaked, um, then in this case, I can break it. So we call this the known uh, plain text attack. And um, it assumes that uh, we know, as an adversary, I know a, a message, a plain message, M and also an encryption of this message. Um, M prime. And M prime, according to this scheme, is the remainder of M times K after dividing out as many multiples of P as possible. Now we saw, um, now suppose I know these two, I'm going to show to you how to break it. So let's have a look. M uh, the, the encryption M prime here is congruent to M times K modulo P. We just proved it over here. And uh, what do we know? We know that P is a, a public prime. I know P. Since it's a prime, I know that the GCD of M and P equals 1. So these two are relatively prime. So now if they are relatively prime, and that's what we wrote up here, we know that there exists this linear combination of, uh, in this case, uh, M, and, uh, M and P uh, that is equal to 1. And in this way, we can figure out how to compute uh, the inverse, the multiplicative inverse of M. So that's what we are going to do. So we can compute... Uh, the multiplicative inverse uh, such that M times M inverse is congruent to 1 modulo P. So now we can do the next step. Uh, so well, well, what could I do next? So let's see. If I have such an inverse, then I can take my uh, encrypted uh, message that I have as an attacker which is M prime, um, I know M, and since P was public, I can compute this uh, multiplicative inverse, so I can just compute this uh, product, and I know that this is actually equal to, well, K times M times M inverse. This is, again, equal to, congruent to 1 modulo P. 
So this is equal to k modulo p. So now all of a sudden, I know k modulo p because I know those two. So if I know k, I can compute its multiplicative inverse. So I can compute k inverse uh, modulo p. And if I know k inverse, again, I can use it to decrypt any other uh, encrypted message that I receive. So for all future encrypted messages, I do not need anymore the plain messages. I have already used, just by using one plain message encryption pair, I have been able to compute the secret key and the whole scheme is broken. So security in, in, is, is kind of an interesting uh, uh, science. Uh, we can always think of uh, more tricks to uh, break schemes or other assumptions um, that we haven't thought about before. Um, so now let's uh, talk about, uh, so, so, so what did we do here? Um, we have been talking about, uh, about encryption, this, uh, these two schemes. We talked about modular arithmetic, <coughs> talked about congruence, and also the multiplicative inverse, and we showed how to uh, use that to break Turing's code version number two. So we need something much more fundamental in order to uh, create a scheme that is really secure, and that's what we're going to do now. We're going to start off with Euler's uh, uh, totient function and then prove a related uh, theorem. And with that, we will be able to actually create, uh, explain the RSA algorithm, which is a famous algorithm invented here at MIT in 1977 by, uh, by Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman. And uh, they actually also got the Turing Award for this a few years ago. Um, and it's widely used uh, in, in practice. But we will be able to actually explain this algorithm with just this fundamental piece of number theory. So that's really exciting. So let's do this. Um, so we're going to first define uh, Euler's uh, totient function. And it's related to this multiplicative inverse. This function is uh, denoted by phi of n. And it denotes uh, the number of integers of integers in 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n minus 1 that are relatively prime that are relatively prime to n. So, well, this is, uh, this just uh, drops out of the air, you may think, but um, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, a fundamental uh, quantity, and uh, Euler's theorem is what we will try to prove next. But let's give uh, a couple of examples about this, um, just to see how it works. So for example, let's take n to be equal to 12. Um, what would be uh, the value of uh, Euler's totient function, evaluated for 12? So. If we take 12, we have uh, the following numbers to consider. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So now let's have a look. We want to count the, the, we want to count the integers that are relatively prime to, uh, to 12. Um, well, uh, 1 is relatively prime to 12. Why is that? Because the GCD of 12 and 1 is equal to 1, and it's a definition of being relatively prime. So this is a good number. Hmm. The GCD of 12 and 2, 
Well, both are divisible by two, and so they're not relatively prime because the GCD is at least two, in this case equal to two. Three also divides 12, four divides uh, 12, five is relatively prime with respect to 12, six actually is, uh, is dividing 12 as well, seven is uh, relatively prime, and 11 over here as well, and all the others have a greatest common divisor that is larger than one. So here we see that the Eulatoshit function in ev evaluated in 12 is equal to four. There are one, two, three, four integers that are relatively prime. Okay, so let's have a different one, say n equals 15. It's a little bit different because here you may uh, think this is kind of coincidental that one, five, seven, and 11 are actually also primes. But for 15, it looks a little bit different. So let's write out all the numbers. Um, again, let's have a look. Well, one has greatest common divisor equal to one, two, with respect to 15. Uh, two, well, it's also relatively prime with respect to 15. Three is dividing 15. Four, yeah, four and 15 have greatest common divisor equal to one. So that's relatively prime. Um, five is not, uh, six is not, seven is relatively prime. Eight again, this is only divisible by a power of two. And this has no power of two in it. Uh, nine, 10 uh, are this one is divisible by five, divisible by three. 11 is again relatively prime. And then we have 13 is relatively prime as well. And 14 as well, because this is two times seven and this is three times five. So how many do we see now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the euler totient function evaluated in 15 is actually equal to eight. Now, it turns out that uh, this uh, function has really nice properties, and you can uh, easily calculate if you, know its, uh, if you know the decomposition of n into its primes and powers of primes, you can easily compute uh, this number, uh, phi of n. Um, now, you will be able to find this in the book. You should read it, and also the problem set talks about this. But for now, let's just uh, uh, talk about this as an abstract notion because that's all that we will use in this lecture. But you will have a few exercises that talk about computing this kind of stuff. Okay. So um, let's talk about the euler totient uh, function uh, and Euler's theorem. So let me use uh, this blackboard. Now this is really an exciting uh, theorem and it's a little bit hard to prove. That's why we will need uh, a little bit more time to do this. Uh, Euler's theorem says the following. If the GCD of uh, n and k is equal to one, uh, then k to the power the euler totient function evaluated in n is actually congruent to one modulo n. So this is what we're going to prove here. So why is this so interesting? Well, we will uh, talk about an application which is a direct consequence of this theorem which we'll call Fermat's uh, little theorem. And that in turn, we will use to explain the RSA algorithm and show how decryption works and so on. So how can we prove this? Um, we will start with uh, a first lemma. And, um, and then we're going to do a few uh, uh, tricks, mathematical tricks, you will see it. So the first lemma is that um, 
if I know that the GCD, which is what we're assuming the statement of the theorem, if I know that the GCD of n and k equals 1, then I know that um, a times k, if a times k is congruent to b times k modulo n, then this implies that a is congruent to b modulo n. Well, this seems to be kind of a straightforward lemma. I will only talk about its proof. Um, so how do we do it? Well, first of all, I know that the GCD of n and k equals 1. So that means that um, I can create a, a multiplicative uh, inverse because I know that there is such a linear combination that, uh, that will uh, end up uh, to 1. So I have the multiplicative inverse. I multiply both sides with this. And then I will end up to A is congruent to B modulo N. And actually, you can use some of the facts on your sheet to, uh, to prove this. And uh, in the problem set, you probably have seen that there are a number of uh, problems uh, related to this. And uh, you will also, so, so you will recognize this and prove a few of these things yourself. OK, so, um, so this is, uh, so let me see. Uh, so let me see what we have done here. Um, actually, I noticed that I've missed one statement that I would like to explicitly mention. I mean, I've used it a few times. Uh, let me do that first, which is that um, we know that uh, if the GCD of n and k equals 1, uh, then if and this is if and only if the case if k has a multiplicative inverse. I did not, have not yet explicitly stated this. And we can uh, easily see this. Let me just give a quick proof to show how this works. Um, well, if the GCD is equal to 1, then we use the statement up there. So this is uh, if and only if. There exists a linear combination, so an S and a T, such that N times S plus uh, K times T equals 1. Well, then I also know that there exists uh, a T such that um, actually the difference uh, between 1 and k times t is divisible by n. So n divides the difference of k times t minus 1. So why is that? Well, if I look at the difference between k times t and 1, that difference is n times s. And n times s is div divisible by n. So now by the definition of congruence, um, I just apply the definition over here. We have written it out here. We can say that uh, k times t is congruent to 1 modulo n. And uh, this is the definition of the multiplicative inverse. So we have essentially shown that if the greatest common divisor between n and k is equal to 1, then it has a multiplicative inverse. Okay, we have been using this uh, property uh, over here because we assume that the greatest common divisor is equal to 1. So we now know that there exists a multiplicative inverse of k. We use that one to multiply uh, away, essentially, the k out of this equation and get a is congruent to b modulo n. Also notice that we use that property over here um, we said um, that we uh, wanted to compute, uh, what was it again? Uh, oh, over here. We started off with the GCD of m and p to be equal to 1, and I know p, and now I can compute the multiplicative inverse of m, and I should have said why it exists. 
and it exists because of that uh, lemma that, we, that I just mentioned up here. Okay, so now let's go back to Euler's uh, theorem. Um, this first lemma we are going to use to prove a second lemma, and that second lemma we can finally use to uh, prove the theorem. All right. So this lemma I will put on a separate uh, board um, because it contains quite a number of steps to prove. So the lemma states that um, if we suppose that um, the GCD of n and k equals 1, so it's the same assumption as before. Uh, if we let uh, k1 all the way up to kr to be those integers in the range 1, 2, 3, and so on to n minus 1 um, that are relatively prime, so these denote the integers relatively prime to uh, n. Then we can uh, prove a very interesting property. Now notice, by the way, that uh, r in here is equal to the value of the euler stoshin function evaluated in n, because this counts the total number of uh, of, of numbers that are relatively primes, um, prime with respect to n. So now we can prove something really spectacular. Um, we can show that the set that contains all these remainders, the remainder of k1 times k, after dividing out as many multiples of n as possible, all the way to the remainder of kr times k, after dividing out as many multiples of n as, as possible, this set is actually equal to the set k1 up to kr. So this is what we're going to prove. And we'll do it in two steps. Uh, we first show that this set uh, has exactly r numbers, so the cardinality of that set is equal to r, so that will be our first step in the proof. And over here we will show that every remainder is actually uh, relatively prime to n, so it must be part of this set. So we will show that this is a subset of this set in the second part of the proof. And combining those two, we are able to prove equality. Why is that? Well, I have r distinct elements in this set, I have r distinct elements in this set. This one is a subset of this, so that can only happen if they are equal. So this is the, uh, the method for uh, the proof. Oh, I should. Um, so we will start with uh, the first part. And the way to do that is to uh, see whether it is possible that, whether it's possible that, if, that, that any of those two, any two remainders in that set, can they be equal to one another? We will show that that's not possible. So if it's not possible, then all these remainders must be different, and we have exactly R of those. So let's do this. So the proof for uh, one is as follows. Let's assume that we have two remainders, say ki times k, um, and uh, a remainder uh, kj times k after dividing out as many multiples of n. Suppose that they are equal to one another. You are going to show that this can only happen if ki is equal to kj. And if you uh, can see that, well, then we know that all these different remainders are actually different from one another. And if they're all different from one another, then we must have exactly r, because we have k1 up to kr in here. OK, let's, uh, let's see where we can do this. 
Um, well, if we know that these two remainders are equal to one another, we can look at them uh, with respect to uh, these definitions over here, and we can uh, show that ki times k is actually congruent to kj times k modulo n. So why is this? Well, these two remainders are the same, and ki times k is equal to this remainder plus a multiple of n. This kj times k is equal to this remainder plus a multiple of n. So the difference between those two are also, is, is also a multiple of n. And that's the definition of congruence. So now uh, we can uh, use our uh, first lemma, that is, which is stated over here. We know that we assumed in Euler's theorem that the GCD of n and k is equal to 1. Um, if a times k is congruent to b times k modulo n, then we know that a is congruent to b modulo n. So let's apply it over here and take for a ki, and for b we can take kj. So now we see that key ki is congruent to kj modulo n. And from this we will conclude, and that takes an extra step, that ki is actually equal to kj. So how can we do this? Well, we know that uh, ki and kj are both in the range from 1 all the way up to n minus 1. So if I look at the difference between those two, so by definition of congruence, I know um, that n divides ki minus kj. I know that this one is in the range from uh, 0 up to n minus 1. This one is in the range of 0 up to n minus 1. The only way how, the, how a difference of two numbers in this range can be divisible by n if this thing is equal to 0. And that means that ki equals kj. So now we are done with the first part because we have shown that if I take any two remainders over here, it must be that uh, they can only be equal to one another if actually the ki is equal to the kj. So we actually were looking at the same remainder. So the remainders in this set are all different and there are exactly r of those. So now we go to the second part of the proof. Uh, And um, and notice that we are so far we've only been proving the second lemma, and we still need to go to Euler's theorem as, as well. So it still takes a few steps. Um, so how do we do the second part? Well, we saw in last lecture that uh, we were explaining. Uh, uh, Euclid's uh, uh, algorithm, and we used essentially this property. We said that the greatest common divisor between n and the remainder of, uh, say, ki times k and n is actually equal to the greatest common divisor of n and ki times k. So why is this again? Well, the remainder is actually um, equal to ki times k minus a multiple of n, right? So the greatest common divisor is therefore uh, between n and this is the same as the greatest common divisor between n and ki times k. So you should have a look at last lecture. And uh, now we are pretty much done. Why is this? Because uh, we have assumed that the greatest common divisor between uh, n and k is equal to 1, and ki in the statement of the lemma is relatively prime to n. And that means, according to the definition over there, that the greatest common divisor between ki and n is also equal to 1. So we know that both these greatest common divisors are equal to 1. So that means that there is no common divisor between n and, and, and this, except for one, of course. 
So what does this say? Well, this means that this remainder, according to our definition, is relatively prime to n, because this greatest common divisor is equal to 1. So if it is an uh, um, integer relatively prime to n, then it must be one of those ki's, kj's, in this set that is stated in the lemma. So this shows that it must be part of this set over here. So we have pro proven the, the fact that the set of all the remainders is a subset of uh, the set k1 up to kr. So now we're done. So now that we have shown this particular um, uh, lemma, we can continue and um, prove Euler's uh, theorem. And I will probably need to wipe out some of this. Uh, yep. So let's So let's use this lemma to prove this theorem. So this is really a neat trick. Um, so the proof of uh, Euler's uh, theorem is as follows. We are going to take the product of all those ki's over there and see whether we can find a nice relationship. So we take k1 times k2 all the way times kr. And we know, because those two sets are actually the same, that this is equal to the remainder, the first remainder, k times um, k1 times k, um, after dividing out as many multiples of n. And we go all the way up to the final one, the remainder of kr times k, uh, dividing out as many multiples of n. So now we can see that, uh, well, we have already shown that um, each of those remainders, right, is congruent to, in this case, this one is congruent to k1 times k modulo n, and this one is congruent to kr times k modulo n. So let's write this out. So it's k1 times k, and then we have k2 times k, and finally we have kr times k modulo n. So let's uh, regroup those. We see k1, k2, all the way up to kr reappearing. And we have uh, a k here, a k here, and we have that r times. So we have times k to the power r modulo n. So now we are able to again use this particular lemma over here. So what do we do? Well. Um, we know that k1 is relatively prime to n, and k2 is as well, all the way up to kr. So this whole product is also relatively prime with respect to n. That means that the greatest common divisor of this whole product with n is equal to 1. So that means that I can divide out this whole product. Right? We have, uh, so let's uh, do, do this. We have, say, 1 times this product, we take this for A, and we take this for B, and then we can divide this whole thing out uh, according to this particular lemma by using the multiplicative inverse of that product. So now we see that 1 is equal to k to the power r modulo n, and remember in our theorem uh, r over here in this lemma r is actually equal uh, to the Euler totient function in n. So now this equation proves the whole theorem. Okay. So um, now I'm going to talk about uh, RSA, which is the last uh, part here. So maybe uh, you all would like to uh, have a little break of a couple of minutes just to uh, relax a bit. And then uh, and shake hands with your neighbors and uh, jump up in the air if you like to. All right, let's start with uh, the RSA algorithm. So we have done uh, everything up to this point. And we're actually, uh, we have done these two over here. We still have to talk about Fermat's little theorem. 
But then we can go for RSA, and that uses this consequence of uh, Euler's uh, theorem. So Fermat's uh, little theorem is actually talking about what happens if n is a prime number. It says, well, suppose p is a prime, then, uh, and if you have k in the range 1, 2, all the way up to p minus 1, then we can, con con then we can conclude that k to the power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo n. And we can directly prove this uh, by using uh, Euler's th uh, a theorem. So how do we do this? Well, we know that p is prime. So the numbers 1, um, numbers 1, 2, all the way up to p minus 1 are actually relatively prime. 2p. So why is that? Well, p is prime, right? So the greatest common divisor between any of those with p is equal to 1. That's the definition of relatively prime. And we know uh, that um, we can now uh, apply uh, Euler's theorem over here and see that uh, k to the power phi of p uh, is, 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 of course, um, concurrent to 1 modulo uh, p. That's Euler's theorem. But now, since we know that these are the exact ones that are relatively prime, we can explicitly compute the Euler-Toshian function of p, because there are p minus 1 numbers that are relatively prime to p. So that's the definition over here. So the number of integers in the range 1 up to p minus 1 they're all relatively prime. So we know that uh, phi of p is equal to p minus 1. So now we have shown that uh, k to the power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo k. Now this is kind of interesting because we can use this uh, theorem also to compute the multiplicative inverse of uh, k in this particular case. So how, how do we do this? Um, we just take uh, k and we look at what happens if we multiply k with k to the power p minus 2. Well, this is equal to k to the power p minus 1, which is congruent to 1 modulo p, according to, our, uh, according to Fermat's uh, theorem. So now when we look at the definition of multiplicative inverse over here, we see that uh, k to the power p minus 2 is actually the multiplicative inverse of k. So k inverse is actually equal to k to the power p minus 2 modulo k. All right, so this theorem we're going to use now in the description of RSA. As I said, it was uh, um, only decades later after Turing, um, Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman were the first to really show how number theory could be applied so successfully in cryptography. And they essentially showed the first public key encryption scheme in which a sender and a receiver do not necessarily have to exchange a secret key. That's not necessary. So they had a public key method. And that's still uh, used uh, today. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a great invention. So how does the RSA work? Uh, again, we have to talk within an encryption scheme about what happens beforehand. So beforehand, we need to generate this public key and the secret key. So the idea is that the receiver uh, creates a public key and also a secret key. Um, he will publish the public key and he will keep the secret key for himself. And now anybody can use the public key to encrypt 
a message. The encrypted message, message is sent to the receiver and he is going to use his secret key to get back to the plain message. So how is he going to do this? Well, in the first step, um, the idea is to generate uh, two distinct primes. Turns out that this can be done in a very efficient way. Uh, there are lots of primes among the integers, so you just sample, and it turns out that you can test primality uh, with a pretty high probability very efficiently, and recently actually there has been a deterministic algorithm uh, that is polynomial in a number of bits of the primes that can actually tell you whether you have a prime or not. So you can do this. Two, we are going to create a product of these two distinct primes, and that's where our assumption is going to help us, uh, that it is hard to factor a product of two large primes. That's going to be the underlying hardness assumption of the RSA encryption scheme. So let n be this. Uh, three, uh, we're going to select an uh, integer e such that the greatest common divisor of e with the product p minus 1 times q minus 1 is actually equal to 1. And the public, and, and once we have uh, created this, the public key is going to be a pair. Um, so is the pair that consists of E itself together with N. So that's the public key. And the secret key is going to be uh, computed as follows. In step four, we are going to compute um, D such that d times e is congruent to 1 modulo uh, that product of p minus 1 times q minus 1. Uh, can we do this? Yeah, because the greatest common divisor between e and that product is equal to 1. And we have shown over here that therefore it has a multiplicative inverse. So first of all we know that the solution D exists, and we can also efficiently compute it. So um, the secret key is going to be the pair that consists of D and also N. So how does it work? The uh, sender is knows the public key, E and N, and uses those to encrypt the message. I will explain it in a moment. And then uh, the uh, receiver knows the secret key, D and N, and then is able to decrypt it. Okay, so let's see how encryption works. And then we will have to do a lot of mathematics to get the decryption going. So M prime, which is uh, is computed, so the encrypted plain text is computed as the remainder of m to the power e, which is part of the public key, and then the finding out as many multiples of n as possible. It turns out, and we are going to prove this, that decryption works as follows. Uh, we can compute m by using m prime, so we receive m prime. What do we do? We're going to take m prime, raise it to the power d, which is uh, part of the secret key, and then dividing out as many multiples of n. Now, why would that work? Why would, uh, why would this work? So let's prove uh, uh, this step over here. Well, it turns out that we can apply Fermat's uh, theorem, and uh, the idea is as follows. So, Let's have a look. We know that m prime is equal to the remainder of m raised to the power e, uh, which is congruent to m to the power e modulo n. We have seen this now a number of times, right? So what does this imply? 
This implies that m prime to the power d is actually equal, uh, is congruent to m to the power e to the power d. So I just raise this side to the power d, and I raise this side to the power d, and I still, um, and I know now that uh, m prime to the power d is equal to m to the power e d, uh, congruent to m to the power e d modulo n. So now we know that there exists an integer r. Uh, we are going to use the fact that we have that e and p minus 1 times q minus 1 have a greatest common divisor of 1. So we know that e times d is actually equal to uh, 1 plus r times p minus 1 times q minus 1. Actually, what I use here is uh, the fact is this over here. By the definition of congruency, I know that the difference between those two, d times e and 1, is divisible by this product. So I know that there exists an integer such that e times d equals 1 plus a multiple of that product. That's how it works. So we know that m prime to the power d, we already saw that it is equal to m to the power e d, um, which is congruent to, well, we just replace ed by 1 plus r times this multiple. So we have m to the power 1 times m to the power this part, r, p minus 1, q minus 1. Okay. So now we are finally uh, going to... Uh, get to Fermi's uh, theorem, we know that n is the product of p and q. And uh, I'm not actually sure why I do this here, but... Hmm. Okay, so let's apply Fermi's theorem and see how we can uh, use this. So if m is not equal, it's not congruent to 0 modulo p, well, then we can apply Fermi's theorem. We, uh, um, where is it? It's, it's over here. Uh, we can only apply this if k is in the range from 1 to p minus 1. It's not equal to 0. So if m is not equal to 0, not, not congruent to 0 modulo p, then we can apply the theorem and state that m to the power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. And in the same way, we can do this for q. So if this is not true, modulo uh, q, then m to the power q minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo q. So here we have uh, used Fermat's uh, theorem twice. Now we can apply uh, what we have learned before, uh, which is uh, what we wrote down over here, m prime to the power d is congruent to this modulo n. Now, n is p times q, so let's have a look what that means. It means that since n is a product of p and q, we can also look at this uh, congruent modulo p. So in particular, we know that m prime to the power d is congruent to m times m r p minus 1 times q minus 1 modulo p. Why is that? Well, we know that n divides this difference by the definition of congruency. n is equal to p times q. So if n divide, uh, is, is, is dividing this difference, also p is dividing this difference. So that's why we can write it m prime to the power d is congruent to this thing modulo p. And of course, we can uh, repeat this for q. So let me write this out as well. So there it is. So now we can um, uh, use what we have figured out over here. So we know that if m is not equal to 0, then this thing over here cancels out because m to the power p minus 1 is congruent to 1. So 
we have that m prime to the power d is congruent to m modulo p if m is not congruent to zero modulo p, right? Because if m is not congruent to zero, we have this particular equation. We plug it in over here. This all cancels, and we just leave are left with m. Now, if m is equal, is congruent to zero modulo uh, p, well, then we can see that it is equal to zero. So it's equal to zero. So this actually holds for any case. Now, we can do the same for a q, the same argument, and show that this must hold. So now we know that p divides the difference of m prime d minus m. q is another prime that divides this difference. And the only way that that is possible is if the product of p and q is dividing both, is, is dividing this uh, particular number this difference. And we have two different primes that are dividing the same number, so the product must divide it. So P times Q divides M prime D minus M. Oh, but P times Q is equal to N. So now we're almost done, because now we can state, by the definition of congruency, that M prime to the power D is congruent to M modulo n. Now, since m is a message that is in the range of, uh, of, 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 so I did not write it down here, so m is a message which is in the range of 0 all the way up to n minus 1, we know, and we have seen that before with Turing's code, that we can rewrite this and, stay and say that m equals the remainder of m prime to the power d after multiplying out as many multiples of n as possible. So here you go. So this is the decryption uh, rule, and it works. We have shown that this equation truly holds. So uh, RSA has really withstood uh, the test of time. Uh, it's already out there for many decades, and it's still widely used. I wanted to talk a little bit about this, but uh, there seemed not to be enough uh, time, but I'd just like to mention that, uh, that uh, only in 2009, uh, Greg Gentry proved a beautiful theorem and was able to evaluate uh, Boolean circuits or, or uh, say, a certain type of programs under encryption. So you can sort of add and multiply ciphertext encryptions together, and it is as if you multiply them at the plain text level. That was a fantastic... Uh, that was an enormous open problem, and he solved it. And only a few months uh, earlier, in 2010, in joint work with Greg and some other colleagues uh, at, at IBM, we showed it with very simple arithmetic that just uses modulo p and modulo 2 kind of things. We could show a construction that uses uh, such, that has such a property, such an encryption scheme over the integers. So there's still a lot of stuff going on in this area. And really, we use this type of very basic stuff. The problem in cryptography is to show that it is secure. So we have to show that uh, breaking the scheme needs to be reduced to some really hard problem. And, that is usually, and that's always the really uh, difficult part of uh, such type of research. OK, well, have uh, lots of uh, fun uh, with the recitation. <laughs>